and go into this one. There we are. All right. All right. Now we're going. All right. Okay. So, so pesticides incite intense emotions here. As you can tell by bonehead numbskull, um, the realities are it is very intense how people feel. And when people say, well, you're, you're using what? You're doing what? Well, we, we want to be able to have a crop. We want you to grow. Too many chemicals often results in problems <laughs> one, one way or another. But the key to success in my, in my approach today, mines are like parachutes. They only function when they're fully open. So hopefully we'll have a, we'll have a good time. We'll, we'll sail. We'll, we'll parachute down together through this topic. Here's what I'm hoping to accomplish. Yes, it seems like a lot. It probably is. But we're going to try to accomplish. And I believe that Lee will be monitoring chat, Lee or Cassandra monitoring chat so if there's questions put them in there and we'll just deal with them all right so Porcellus stated 500 over 500 years ago dosis facet benenem well what does that mean you say it's dose makes the poison so for example digitalis that's often used to cardiac to to deal with cardiac arrhythmia in heart patients or other, the idea is, what's the difference between this cardiac dealing and slowing that arrhythmia and stopping the heart? Dose. Dose is what it comes down to. Coumarin, which is blood, which can serve as a blood clot preventer, blood thinner, so you don't get blood clots. One derivative of that is warfarin, which is a rat poison. So it's interesting that once you start to see that it's dose that makes the poison. How much, how little, sometimes one thing at a certain level is very beneficial, while another, well, in this one of the cases, stop your heart. So let's define what a pesticide is. According to the Environmental Protection Agency, any substance or mixture of substances intending for preventing, destroying, repelling, or mitigating any pest. Any substance or mixture of substances intended for use as a plant regulator, defoliant, or desiccant, and a new one was added, any nitri nitrogen stabilizer. So this is a pest definition of a pesticide, okay? So pesticides include herbicide, pesticide, so all of these, C-I-D-E, this portion here, C-I-D-E means death of, all right? So an herbicide literally means death of a plant. Pisicide, death of fish. You say, what? Yeah, what if you have a lake full of, of carp and you want to start over? What are you going to do? Well, you put in a pisicide, you kill the fish off. And you start over with a clean lake. One of the things that, that's often done. How about a mollicide? That's snails, slugs, a caricide. Acrids are eight-legged, um, eight-legged, not insects, because that's not an insect. It's a invertebrate. So a caricide is a miticide. Fungicides take care of fungi. Insecticides. Take care of insects, rodenticides, bactericides, avicide. What's an avicide? You say, huh? Well, <laughs> avicides are often used at airports to keep birds from being sucked into engines. They put out and are control often flocks of birds so that they don't bring down airplanes. And predicide ultimately used for um, coyotes or other predators of livestock or other things trying to be controlled. So all these, the, the term we use to include all these things, we use pesticides, okay? So you say, what's a pest? Oh, there's two-legged pest also. Yes, I know that. Pesticides are tools. They're simply tools. And tools are always only as effective 
as the person who's using them. This is one of my favorite cartoons. <laughs> it's <laughs> Far Side. And the one guy says, hey, look what Zog do. Now, Zog over here has a stick. He's holding or cooking his food while his two friends here are holding their, their catch in the fire. So it's, it's interesting that how we see these, all of these things can be tools, all right? All pesticides are nothing more than tools. So your task is to name a safe poison. What's a safe poison? Hmm. Well, this is really the crux of the argument for or against pesticides. However, in order to be effective, a toxin or a poison must kill or eliminate some type of pestilence from something desirable. The idea is for it to control something. But a safe poison, um, that's, it's all relative. Now, another thing that's often thrown out there, pesticides it calls chemical wastelands. Well, it's, that's totally false. There's nothing further from the truth. At one time, the pesticides that we did have, like DDT, like, um, uh, like Aldrin, Temic, uh, Chlordane, all of these compounds stayed around in the environment for a long period of time in their, in their stable, unmodified form. Well, they're all gone. They're all eliminated from the environment and from usage now. And, and the question that I have, if using pesticides is so devastating to the environment, then why do you have to reapply them? <laughs> we'll see as we look through labels and things tonight, why do you have to reapply pesticides? Well, the reason is they're broken down. UV light breaks down pesticides easily. Herbicides broken down in, by microbes in the soil they break down. So why are the farms that use pesticides in this country still green and productive? It's because they're tools. Where are the desolate wastelands devoid of life caused by pesticides as described by organics only proponents? Mm, they don't exist. Emotional arguments versus the logical and scientific findings I'm all about the science and I'm gonna share the science with you tonight. So my challenge to you is be defiant, embrace science, resist not knowing for yourself. So choose for yourself. But here's the organic's little secret that isn't often mentioned. Organic does not mean no chemicals used. And in fact, chemicals are used on organic growth, on organic products. They're approved, the products are approved by OMRA, which is the Organic Materials Research Institute. It approves all the, the organic growers and what they can use on their crops. And they do use things on the crops because the truth is, in our environment, we have a pro, our, our heavy humid nights favor things like disease. So sometimes, most times, so when diseases move in, they can put on sulfur, they can use other things. But the idea, people often associate organics with no chemicals used, that's just simply not true. One of my favorite quotes was by Se Senator Patrick Monahan, who said, everyone is entitled to his own opinion, but not his own facts. And, and those are just the facts. And I hope to share with you tonight the facts so that you can make the decisions what you're going to do. In my opinion, here's, here's my opinion. Who are the worst offenders? Homeowners. Well, not these homeowners. This is more the homeowner that who, who, who often the typical motto is, if a little works, then more should work much better. And that has been borne out time and time again. But if you understand these products, you understand these tools, learning how to use them, what to do, and how to best use them, it will benefit you. Because truth, 
truthfully, I believe when people start up businesses, you start interfacing with customers. Customers will forgive you once for a wormy apple or, or they find a worm in their broccoli. They'll forgive you once. Twice, three times, not going to happen. But you need to learn how to control those. And that is going to take some help rather than just walking around and smashing in them, which means more than likely you're going to use some, some type of pesticide. All right. So my philosophy, better living through the wise use of chemicals. Yes. Good old Albert Einstein. Well, remember that medicines are pesticides too. We just, the medical field just was more sensible about, instead of saying, calling them pesticides, they call them medicines. When you take an antibiotic, what are you doing? You're getting, you're actually taking a, uh, a bactericide to knock down the bacteria. How about fungicides? Athlete's foot fungus, you put a little fungicide, a little cream on your foot, get rid of it. Interferon targets certain viruses that, that afflict man and cancer drugs. Cancer drugs uniquely target cells with high metabolic rates for replication and division. The hair cells um, and cancer cells rapidly divide. And by loading up your, blood, your bloodstream with a drug, it goes to these sites and it loads up those cells and those cells die. So medicines are pesticides too. Most of this control is based on selectivity. The dose or amounts that are used. That's why I, everybody hates it. But when you go in to see a doctor, well, they, they weigh you. Why is that? <laughs> they weigh you because often chemicals and whatever treatments or medicines you need is often based on weight. The known sensitivities. Insects are also, their known sensitivities, known tolerances. Insects' ability to detect chemicals. Many insects can detect the chemical, move away from it. How about location or how you, where you put it? If you're trying to control mites, for example, and you only spray the top of a leaf, you'll never control mites because mites most often are on the underside of the leaf. And unless you're using a product that is translaminar is the term, that means it moves in from top, it moves in between, it moves into that leaf blade. You'll never get those mites. And access to toxic, to toxic materials like baits. So we have two broad pesticide categories. First one, restricted use pesticides. These are pesticides that in order to access them, you have to have a license. Uh, both Lee and I teach classes for pesticide applicators. And unless you can't get them because the chemicals available can cause harm to the environment if they're misused. The other one, the general use pesticides can be used by anyone with no further restriction than the label mandate. So the idea is homeowners. These are the ones typically homeowners get, but often there's also a built-in factor of safety because let's, let's be honest, the chemical companies believe that the homeowners are probably gonna do something ridiculous and, <laughs> and strive to safen them by, by not letting them have access to certain concentrations. So it's all, it's all good but it's just understanding what they are. So where do you look? Where should you look? Oh, sorry. I just gave it away, dang it. Where do you look for pesticides impact on wildlife? What about personal protective equipment you were required? What about how long to wait before entering a treated area? All of this is, and now it's stuck, there we go. All of this is on the label. The label, when I, when I was a kid growing up, they actually had a, a, um, a program on TV <laughs> that there was this Larry the Label. Larry the Label says, read the label. Well, it's kind of funny because the truth is 
everything you need to know about using the pesticides, how to use them, when to use them properly, guess what? It's all on the label. All right. So the pesticide label has the most current up, current up-to-date information on how to use that specific pesticide. And by law, the correct use or misuse will be determined by the label you possess. Sometimes chemical reps or manufacturers change the labels. And if you have a label that says you may use it a certain way, but the newer version of that label says you can't, as long as you have that label, you are good to go. You are within the guidelines and it is a legal application. So the best thing to do, I know this irks everybody, <laughs> but, but read the label because it's a violation of federal law to use any pesticide in a manner inconsistent with its labeling. So the labels of pesticides are, are pretty amazing. All right, so by federal law, the active ingredient must be identified on there. It's like reading labels of food, honestly. The first, the first um, item on the label on food is what's the highest content in that product. So it's in with, with pesticides, they have to give you the percentage of that active ingredient or the, the active product in that pesticide. All other ingredients fall into a category called inert ingredients, all right? So the AI, active ingredients, is the main actual pesticide that does, that is, that is either killing fungicides or, or snails or whatever. That's the, that's the product that's doing, that is actively involved. It may require mixing with one or more other chemicals to make it work. The active pesticide are frequently in the form most of our products, especially, I know most people like to use a form called emulsifiable concentrates. Those, most of our derivatives are, are a result of petroleum. Well, how easily can you mix oil and water? So in order to make that product really um, useful to us, it has to be mixed in a solvent that then makes it miscible, makes it be, to be able to, to mix in water as a liquid. So these are all good things. Inert ingredients, it doesn't mean non-toxic, okay? Often you might have multiple inert ingredients and these are all critical in helping with the effectiveness of pesticides. For example, um, with something such as um, there's a product called Onyx. We lost, a, um, we lost Lindane. That was a, a product that we used in the fruit industry to control bores, wood boring insects. Well, when we lost Lindane, that was pretty tough because it had the ability to move into the bark and stay there for two, three months and kill any insect that bored in. That was good on with things like peaches and cherries that have a lot of insects that bore into the bark. Once we lost that, it became a, a real battle until we got to a product called Onyx. Onyx is a permethrin, but what makes this so great is it actually has a penetrant. It has a product that's, that is in where, when you measure it out, that product helps it move and penetrate into the bark and stay there. That's a good deal if you're trying to get rid of, rid of wood boring insects. We call these adjuvants, surfactants, stickers, spreaders, penetrants, safeners, often carriers. And what they do, they prevent caking, foaming, extend the, the life of the pesticide, or their solvents that allow the herbicides to penetrate into things like waxy leaves. So it's, these are all useful and often necessary because think about a cabbage leaf. What happens when you spray water on a cabbage leaf? It just rolls right off. 
So having a surfactant, much like soap, helps for that, that when you spray a product, it spreads out across the surface, stays on that leaf rather than, than pushing up into a droplet and rolling off. What's in a label? Oh boy, there, are a, there is a lot of information in a pesticide label. This is some of it. We'll look at some and, and I pulled a label up to show you. So one of the things, this statement is on every single product, regardless of toxicity. It, it makes sense, keep out of the reach of children, yes, but it is there on every product. Another important thing is signal words. Signal words tell us something about this product. So for the first one, you can guess, if you see a skull and crossbones, your first inclination is, hey, that's, that's poisonous. Yes, it is dangerous. Because in that category, the category one, the danger, poison, just a few drops to one teaspoon has the potential to kill an adult, a lethal dose. Category two, we use the word warning. Category three, caution. And you can see the increasing doses needed possibly to, to affect an adult. The, there, there, yes, there are two cautions. One caution is all, they, this caution, this category four, this caution they often use is, is almost non-toxic. But, you know, the problem with saying something like that is Non-toxic has, we all have our own individual sensitivities. Um, think about um, poison ivy. I don't get poison ivy that easily. My wife, if you just say poison ivy, breaks out. So we all have our own individual sensitivities. So saying that something is non-toxic, uh, we, we advise against that, and I'm sure lawyers do too. So knowing these signal words will help also with how you handle and what you do in order to, to protect yourself. And I just threw this in here because I wanted you to see that some of these, you've got dermal, LD50, you've got primary ir eye irritation, skin irritation. Some will cause skin, pro skin irritation. So the idea is when you see these categories, the danger, the warning, caution, and the idea is this can be, these are products that are intended to kill or eliminate something by their use. Now each pesticide has three names. There's a chemical name, a common name, and a product or brand name. So the, the chemical name, of course, comes through the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry. The, they follow that nomenclature, for example, 356 trichloro 2 pyridinyl, py, pyridinyl oxyacetic acid or n phosphomethyl glycine. If we look at these, that, so those were, those were the chemical names, all right? Those are the chemical names. The, the common name the, the, is a kind of a generic name given to them. And often it's associated and becomes the more, um, the more typically used name rather than the, the chemical name. When we talk about their toxicity, the environmental behavior, and what happens, the first one is triclopyr, which is great for killing poison ivy or, or brush out, out in a pasture or something. N-phosphomethylglycine is glyphosate. So even though there's a, there's a chemical name, now the common name, and then ultimately there's a brand or product name, often given a trademark. For example, triclopyr is Garlon. Garlon 3 or Garlon 4 you know glyphosate, glyphosate, however you want to say it, as Roundup Glystar. This product has um, 
been around for 25, 28 years and has changed the world for us, kind of. It used to be pretty tough, and, and it is a non-selective product. It doesn't distinguish between just grasses or broadleaves. It takes out all of that, all right? So this, I want you to know that these are trade names, and therefore, you've got three names, but here's the trade name, because it gets tricky. Similar brand names may have different ingredients. For example, in the turf industry, um, Grubex, in the first year it was made, had a, pro had a product called imidacloprid. That was the active ingredient. The, it was, it's a neonicotinoid and it did a great job. Well, the next year people used that Grubex just like they had the year before. And they had lots of failures. The second year they used a product called halophenicide, which is, which is a malt accelerating compound, this Mach 2. It was used to, it, it caused the insect to molt and moving from one instar to the next takes a lot of energy. When the insect fed, it ate that product, it made it molt, and, and if it was not in a, in a form or large enough, that actually took a lot of energy and pretty soon killed the insect. The problem is people were still expecting this first year product. They used it the same, but it still had the same name of Grubex and people said, it's a failure. Well, when people started going back and looking, the name, the product, the active ingredient in it had changed. They had kept the name Grubex, but it had changed. There are also different brand names that may have the same ingredients. For example, down here, Glactathion. That's how fascinating. You have VIP Depesto. <laughs> Depesto IM and no pest left, but they both have the same AI, the same active ingredient. So just knowing that you don't often, knowing what one is, sometimes the brand names are much more expensive and you can get the generic thing. The same thing happens in medicine. For example, how many of you feel that Advil is so much better than ibuprofen? Advil, Motrin, it's all the same active ingredient. It's just whatever your preferences are. Advil has a nice sugar coating. <laughs> the generic ibuprofen, same active ingredient. It's just no flashy sugar coating. You just got to stomach it straight down. So the, the ingredient statement, here's, here's where I'll, I'll show you. Typically, this is carbaryl. So the AI, that's the product that controls the pest, must be listed on the label. So we're talking about carbaryl, which is the common trade name is 7. 1-naphyl-N-methyl-carbamate. That's the chemical name. Common name is carbaryl. The inerts are, depending whether you're using a dust, a granule, or a multiple concentrate, it all depends on how you're using this product. So here's an actual label. Note, there's seven. The active ingredient, the AI carbaryl, and it gives you the amount by weight. This is an 4F, meaning this is a flowable product, which means it's already in solution, so you don't have to use it as a powder, but you measure that flowable out. And you can see the inert ingredients are 57%. There's that statement that is on every, every pesticide label. Keep out of the reach of children. And the signal word is caution for this product. So caution tells us something about it, that we need to be careful with it when we're using it. It also gives us there on the label, tells us, Hey, what happens if it's swallowed? I don't know how in the world you'd swallow it, but often, more often than not, in, your, in eyes, as you're, you're mixing up a tank or something, 
and you were looking over down into the tank and you poured it down in and the water splashes back up. The first part of it splashes back up. And that could get in your eyes. All this is available on that label that you can take it, show it, and your doctor or whoever's treating you, physician, it tells you what to do. And that's, that's a great thing. And even on top of that, for medical emergencies, there's a 24-hour-a-day hotline from this company on how to deal with this product. All right? Great information. Awesome. First aid instructions. It even gives, a, if, there, if there is a suspected reaction, it gives them the, the actual atropine sulfate is the antidote, which means nothing to most of us, but atropine sulfate means something to the physicians. That's a pretty common for, uh, a common antidote for many of the pesticides used. But here we go, there's just no guessing about it. This is what to do. The doctor gives instructions to the doctor. That's a great thing. Probably before COVID-19, if you ask 10 people what PPE meant, <laughs> nobody had any idea. Nobody had any idea what, what PPE meant. Well, now we all have a pretty good idea what PPE means personal protective equipment. And for every product, every chemical, they tell you what it is, what you need to wear in order to protect yourself. And in this case, note, applicators and other handlers must wear long sleeve shirt, long pants, chemical resistant gloves. And then they give you a listing of the gloves that are acceptable. Barrier laminate, butyl rubber, nitro rubber, neoprene, polyvinyl chloride, Viton. Then it also makes another statement, shoes and socks. So let's say the Ohio Department of Agriculture inspector stops out because he sees you're walking around a pair of shorts with um, docks on, dock cider, little boat shoes on. Well, do you fall within using this product as you're spraying? He said, Hey, can I see the label of product you're using? Well, if you're not following this label, then you could be liable or you could be fined or warned about using, not protecting yourself or others if you were spraying for somebody else. The idea is this is what is required to use this product to protect yourself, all right? Ironically, um, you get a choice now. Is this person compliant? <laughs> well, he's probably got waterproof on here. He's got something on headgear to control, to protect his head, but he's missing long sleeve shirt and gloves. How about this? Do you see anything wrong with this picture? I love looking at these things. It, it, it's kind of fun for me but so he's spraying grapes he's using a mist blower a uh, um, gas powered mist blower well he's wearing he's got gloves on he has a tyvek suit on that's all good but the problem i have with it is this right here He's using a dust mask. That's not dust that he's blowing out of there. That is a, a really fine mist. I would feel better, and I'm pretty sure that just wearing a dust mask isn't going to cut it. He should have a face mask, another face mask. How about this one? See anything wrong with this? Would he be compliant? Well, he's got a Tyvek suit on. He's got eye gear covering his eyes. He has a nice respirator. <laughs> well, what's wrong? How many of you saw this? <laughs> what's it growing, Eric? What's oh, growing? It, yes, yes, you, you're right. He is. It appears to be cannabis or hemp. <laughs> the, the ironic is 
he doesn't have gloves on. So if it's if it's a toxic enough product to smell, to have a face respirator, why in the world is he not wearing gloves? So these these are just the fun things, the fun weird things I do. All right. So environmental warnings. Here's the warnings. So if you're wondering how what the environment responds when you use this correctly or incorrectly, know what it says. This product is extremely toxic to aquatic and estu estu estuarine invertebrates, meaning you don't want to get this any near water, anywhere near water. And often there are even more instructions on stay back, uh, you know, 200 feet from um, wet areas. The idea is it's helping you to understand how to use this product. There's also another warning. Bees may kill honeybees. Highly toxic to bees exposed to direct treatment or residues on blooming crops. So if bees are out there, note that it says don't apply this product or allow it to drift to blooming crops or weeds if bees are visiting the treatment area. So it's trying to help you learn how to use this product or learn, warn you that if you're not paying attention, this can be a real problem. And you could create problems for yourself because you could create just, well, I'm just going to go out there and spray quick. I have a short amount of time. You could, it's really, seven is, is highly toxic. It does a great job on controlling beetles, um, Japanese beetles, cucumber beetles, things like that. But it is also deadly on bees. Another thing that becomes really important is what we call restricted entry interval. Now, this is if you, you are working with somebody, you hired somebody to work with you. Agricultural use requirements have what's called an REI, restricted entry interval. Note that it says, do not enter or allow worker into treated areas during REI of 12 hours. So after that product is sprayed, you're not supposed to allow people into that area before 12 hours. If they have to go in, note, the PPE, the personal protective equipment required, they state exactly what you need to do. But the idea is to keep those workers out for 12 hours. On the other hand, if it's, not, if it's a non-agricultural use, look what the statement says. The area being treated must be vacated by unprotected persons. Well, that makes sense. <laughs> but it also says, keep unprotected persons out of the treated area till sprays have dried. So the REI, the restricted entry interval, lets us know that, hey, you've got to protect other people. It even gives us storage and disposal. Don't store in areas that are exceed 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, good information. What do you do with the, when you have an empty container? Triple rinse. Recycle it or recondition it or puncture it and dispose of it properly. Crops and the site usage on every label, it talks about the crops and what you need and how you need to use it. Note all the crops here, but what I want to point out is this right here. Control of specific pests across multiple sites. So the idea is even though you have specific use, then we have, then we talk about grasshoppers or ticks, and it may not be a specific site. So note that we're going to look at ticks, which vector Lyme disease. Well, what site would you spray to control ticks? <laughs> well, there's a lot of sites you'd think. You're exactly right. So we pull up that part of the, of the label. And the label says, look, here's, here's what it's got. So all this, all crops on the label, but pastures, right-of-ways, wasteland, hedgerows, ditch banks, reserve, you know, cons conservation set aside, all this information, and it gives us a rate. It always has a low end and a high end. So if we have a high infestation, we'd probably use the upper end of that rate. Note also, target it. it tells us when to apply it. It takes a lot of the guesswork out 
if you bother to read about this product. So the application of nipple control in late spring, or early summer. Don't use spot treatments, treat the entire area. Because ticks may drop off, they may lie down in the duct, or they can also come back in off animals. So it gives you the best opportunity to control them. So when we're talking about in insecticides or any chemical, pesticides, there are multiple formulations, wettable powders, granular, dust, ECs, the emulsifiable concentrates, or even the ready to use, which means you're buying mostly water. They mixed it for you and put it in a sprayer. Whatever your desire, it's perfectly fine. But I want to talk a little bit about fruit, food crops now. Because there's a few things on fruit crops that are a little different. We have what's called a pre-harvest index, the PHI. So right off here, the brassica leafy vegetable crops. Note, so here's the crops that this is registered for. If I have flea beetles, harlequin bug, or leaf hoppers, I have a different rate than I have for armyworm, corn earworm, diamondback moth, ligus bugs, spittle bugs, stink bugs. Notice there's different rates. It also lets me know, look, if I'm going to harvest these and sell them, it tells me for the Brus for broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cab cabbage, cauliflower, and kohlrabi. Do not apply within three days of harvest. If you have to spray them, then you can't harvest them and sell them if, it's with, if you did it two days ago. You've got to wait. The idea is all this research, all this work has been done in labs, in, out in the fields, UV light. UV light will break down most of our products. Therefore, they know that if you follow those directions, you apply this product and you wait four days in harvest, you don't have to worry about illegal residues. Note, however, that for Chinese cabbage, collards, kale, and mustard greens, guess what? It's not three days, it's 14. So you need to pay attention to that PHI, the pre-harvest index. Often uh, you're getting in the middle, you're picking um, your, your cherry tomatoes or, or some other product that turns over quickly, such as you're trying to control sp um, spotted, I, well, I almost said spotted lanternfly, spotted wing drosophila and in, in raspberries. Well, you pick raspberries and if temperatures are above 75 degrees, within a day, to a day and a half, two days, you've got ones that are ready to pick. But if you use certain products and the PHI is seven days, you can't pick them because those residues, those residues have not yet broken down that people don't have to worry about them. So I hope you understand that that's really important when you're using products like any of the products that have residuals. One of the other things you get is called a safety data sheet. This safety data sheet, with any product you buy that is a pesticide, those you can get a hold of those that give you all in, in exquisite detail how to deal with it, um, how, if, if there's a problem for fire and explosion, if it's in a fire, all this information is there. If there's spill or leak, how to deal with it, that's all on the safety data sheet. You keep that in a file. You keep it out of where you store your chemicals, out away from that in case there's a fire in the barn or you just need to grab the folder and run to put out a call the fire department. You've got all the information they need there. Sometimes you add water. Sometimes you use foam. Don't inhale the smoke. All that information is there. So let's talk about one of the techniques used. <clears throat> one of the techniques used is called IPM. And IPM is an integrated pest management. It uses multiple um, first multiple steps to try and manage insects. We use 
First, we identify it. Then we look at prevention. What are my options? Then we monitor the insect. We choose certain options, take an action, and we evaluate and see what happened to that insect. This is a, a more classic one where we go up. As we go up the pyramid, we move from cultural control using natural enemies or antagonists. We use resistant or tolerant cultivars. Um, we look and see how that plant is growing. We determine how many insects, how many insects can I tolerate on that crop and still sell it? Or will people still buy it? Then we move into a biological or can I physically remove insects? Can I, uh, biologically, can we release biological controls? And in the last stage, typically, is chemical. There's biorationals, what we often call softer pesticides. These softer pesticides have their place and our work can be very effective. And they have their flaws, but they also have their place. For example, when we talk about soft pesticides, we're talking about insecticidal soaps, we're talking about abrasives, microbial pathogens, oils, and botanicals. So we're going to look at some of these. Insecticidal soap is produced by, by literally cooking animal fat, fish oil, vegetable with an alkali metal such as sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide. We end up making a, a product that is toxic to insects, especially soft body. Not this. This is not, I can't tell you how many times I've had people say, well, <clears throat> Eric, I, you know, insecticidal soap was kind of expensive, so I just used some dish soap. Don't do that. This dish soap can also kill plants. So insecticidal soap, of course, now that you know about labels, it, nowhere on that Dawn liquid does it say spray on plants. That's an offsite application. It won't work. And often it will kill plants. I can tell you that because I've seen it. Insecticidal soaps, they're, they're made either from fish oils, one that's called safer. The other one, soft soap, are from vegetable oils. The fish soaps, of course, you can tell because you take the lid off that thing, whoo, it's a real stinker. The vegetable oils, they're, they're used more often now, sharpshooters and others. The idea is that soap washes off this epicuticle, the covering of the insect, and it allows it to dehydrate. It takes off there its own, um, its own, it's not a shell. It takes off that outer covering that keeps the, the moisture, the liquids in that, in that invertebrate and allows it to leak out. What a great thing. So insecticidal soaps, in order to be effective, Here's the two most common, safer and impede. The insecticidal soaps to be um, most useful. They're best for soft-bodied insects, aphids, caterpillars. But the thing with insecticidal soaps is we call them contact insecticides. You literally have to contact the insect. So literally, you've got to be really good at spraying, getting in there. Like, for example, aphids. Aphids love to hide up in the growing point of um, the apical stem or in broccoli that, where the broccoli is still expanding. Those aphids love that area. So you have to physically hit them in order to kill them. That just means you have to be consistent. And the other part of that is, if you are, if you have high temperatures, within four days, five days, you might have a reinfestation because you may kill off all the adults, but now the eggs have hatched under those higher temperatures, and the next generation's coming on. 
So insecticidal soaps can be very effective for soft-bodied insects. Abrasives. Now, this has always been an interesting one. Theoretically, these abrasives will <clears throat> also slice up, cut, damage that epicuticle. Therefore, ultimately, the, the insects leak to death. Well, that's, in a way, that can be fun. If you find, go out and find your, your plants all covered by aphid, it makes you mad. You want to get some back. <clears throat> so you say, okay, I'm going to do that. Well, there are some, the ones probably most people are familiar with, diatomaceous earth. Diatomaceous earth is made of diatoms that's mined out of the ground. One newer one is called surround, and it's a clay, kale and clay. It's not really, um, it doesn't abrade the insect. It's just an irritant. Insects use their feet for tasting. And so when you have this clay covering, this surround, it kind of irritates them. They just want to move off and away from it. And it's been shown to have a pretty good effect. The plant itself looks kind of white and off color, which is strange, but it still photosynthesizes and produces. And so these, this, this diatomaceous earth is probably the one that when somebody says abrasives, this is the first thing to come to mind. And this, even though there's a little kid, this is what an insect's like, <clears throat> coming over, getting abraded. One of the other new, newer hot topics, hot approaches, is microbial pathogens, using fungi, bacteria, and viruses to cause diseases in insects. That's a cool thing. That's a great thing. There's a, near, a relatively narrow spectrum of activity. So it works on some, for example, the ones that work on caterpillars do a great job, and, and I'll share those with you. But on, they'll, under certain conditions, young caterpillars are more susceptible than older caterpillars. And there's a, there's a myriad of, of issues or what they need in order to be effective, but rarely are they 100% effective. So even though there's a narrow spectrum or they're very effective on one, but don't touch another, I'll show you what I mean. Some have been engineered or enhanced to kill target insects more rapidly. What do I mean? Here's some of our bacterial bad guys. Bacillus thuringiensis variety Kerstaki. BT Israeliensis and BT Tenebrianus. Well, the cool thing, they're all called BTs, but they're very different. Note that the Kerstaki, Dipel, Thuricide, Javelin, if you knew the, these control Lepidoptera, and that's all it controls. So it just controls moth and butterfly larvae. That's it. That's all the Kerstaki will handle. The other one, Bacillus thuringiensis israeliensis, interestingly enough, you know, back, back uh, mosquito, mosquito attack, it controls diptera. Diptera is the flies. Have you ever, you know, those mosquito dunkers? Those look like little donuts, you throw them out in your pond. Well, this is what it is. You're putting a microbe in there that literally attacks just the diptera, the black fly, mosquito, and fungus gnat larvae. That's pretty cool, but it doesn't take care of anything else, just those things. The last one, the Tenebrianus, Tenebrianus uh, and San Diego. This one controls just beetle larvae. Some do a pretty good job on, Cole, on the Colorado potato beetle. It can, if you can get them or spray them with this product and it move, it can penetrate into the beetle. More often, it's, it's the young, the larvae, that this is more effective on rather than the adult beetles. But this can do a pretty good job on 
controlling beetles with a microbe that exists in the soils. This is where they found the BTs. That's pretty cool. We also have some viruses like Gypcheck and others that control. We use these to control gypsy moths or things like that. Again, specifically, this is for Lepidopter larvae. The problem is you need, in order to infect the Lepidopter, the, the caterpillars, you need certain conditions. The it can't be too dry, can't be too wet. Things have to be just so. Often used over the forest to help us control these outbreaks of insects. We have, there's an organic, as it breaks down, it provides a little bit of uh, nitrogen. Ironically, we also grow out, we culture some of these bacterium and then the, what they excrete, the byproducts, we extract and refine, and some of these work very well at very low doses. I don't know if you recognize it, spinosad. Spinosad does a great job. It's, it's kind of expensive, but it does a very good job on controlling many of our soft-bodied insects, especially the Lepidoptera larvae. If you're growing um, broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, the big thing to try to control are the, the imported cabbage worms, the cabbage loopers. Those are tough, but spinosa does a really good job with that. So those are alternatives. The other things are oils. Highly refined petroleum oils, lightweight oils. And they're used, you mix them with water. These oils, you, we have multiple names. Volk, this one, V-O-L-C-K, is the true dormant oil. This Volk oil, if, you're, if you are involved in uh, nursery or fruit growing, Volk oil is the oil that you put on. It's a much heavier weight than the sun spray, the superior, or horticultural oil. These two oils, more specifically, is called a dormant oil, even though everybody says, well, you put it on before anything grows. That's not really true. You want to put it on specifically in, in apples and things. You want to wait till you almost see that those little pink beginning to emerge from the buds when you put that on because the insects are also, their activity, their egg development correlates with temperature. So the longer you wait and you use these heavier weight oils, Literally, that heavier weight oil will just smother those insect, those pest insect eggs. The dormant oils are, are typically one, one time a year approach. The rest of the time we're using these, what we call horticultural oils, summer oils, ultra pure oils. Oil kills by membrane disruption or suffocation. So it causes, disrupts the membrane, makes them twist, turn out. So it kills them, disrupts those membranes. They, they leak to death, disrupts their feedings. Again, most, most effective on the things such as scales, or I should say in scales, it should be scale crawlers. So crawlers, scale crawlers, mites, mite eggs, mealy bugs, aphids, and caterpillars. The oils do a great job, mites. But just like the soaps, oils are, are only as effective as you are applying them, getting them on, physically contacting the insect. You have to physically contact the insect. And that can be problematic depending on which insect you're going after. Often insects sense you moving and will literally fall off. I don't know if you ever try to catch aphids. They sense you if they're not tapped into the phloem. They sense you coming. They just let go and fall to the ground. Your application has to correlate with their susceptibility in these oils. And that's pretty key. Knowing when is the weak time in that insect's life cycle in order to use oils and make it work. There's a million of these. Um, the jury is still out. 
sesame oil, fish oil, neem oil, rosemary oil, soy oil, cinnamon oil, and clove. It's, I've, I've gone into greenhouses. Like, suddenly, I'm like, man, what is that smell? It's like, wow. So we're trying this new clove oil, cinnamon oil. That's also in kind of, they also use it often, this, this clove oil or cinnamon oil. They'll mix certain formulations to make it more effective on certain soft-bodied insects. Botanicals. These are chemicals extracted or derived from plants. That's where most of our chemicals first came from. Um, you can, ironically, there are now products that trigger the plant to initiate its own, its own toxins. We call these it's systemically acquired resistance, um, but there's a cost to the plant. Typically, it produces, even though you turn on this defense mechanism in the plant, it literally, you probably will get half the, half the uh, produce, half the fruit return, because that plant is defending itself naturally, if you want. But the cost, there's a cost to the plant to produce those chemicals. Some of these, I don't know if you recognize these, Harpen, Messenger, Actigard or all these systemically acquired resistant products that you spray on the plants, they produce these toxins that repel insects. There's also chemicals that have been commercially created um, after extracting them from plants. Only a few found a niche. Um, some of these uh, pyrethrins, this one is the one that probably most people know as a directin, this neem oil. We used to use this quite often in the greenhouse when I worked in a greenhouse. And neem did a pretty good job on most soft-bodied insects. The aphids, the um, young white flies, it did a pretty good job on them. But again, it is a contact product. You've got to get it. And when you're trying to get white flies on the underside of leaves and coat the whole leaf, man, that can be a real job. Also, we have modified esters of chrysanthemums. That's where this first chrysanthemate came from, chrysanthemums. That was some of our first um, botanicals. We created, we synthesized these products, called them pyrethroids. Um, and we enhance their ability by adding a few other chemical add-ons to make them more effective. We use very, the rates, interestingly enough, you know, you may be talking a third of an ounce per acre, which is almost tough for most people to measure. They're the most readily available and effective for homeowners and commercial uses. Although these are now under scrutiny because they're probably the number one, the FQPA is Food Quality Protection Act. These are the ones most available to homeowners and in products that homeowners can obtain. So in the eyes of the um, Environmental Protection Agency, they say, well, because they're all always available, that means you're going to encounter them more, so we need to get rid of some of them. So that's under question now. Um, Ammo, Asana, Warrior, Lama, Silo, Hathren, they're all great products, work very well, only need a little bit of them, but they're now under review. So what do you do? Well, stuff like this is just kind of a normal thing. It's not a result. This is what vegetables do. They kind of mutate around, kiss the future, and hold to our past. That's the size. That, that's young. That was Lee Beer's dad. Yeah. Well, with that, I will stop sharing. Questions for me or questions I didn't answer.
The question's for Lee. Thanks, Eric. Sure. <clears throat> so a couple of comments. Um, me and I don't miss organic chemistry. <laughs> um, yeah, oh, yes. And, and uh, some questions and comments about um, eye protection and gloves and PE. Yes. And, and there's a comment about or problems for neighbors if the wind is strong enough and just if you are over applying chemicals. All right, let's let's think about wind. Wind can be a problem. I mean, when we're talking to commercial or homeowners, the idea is, look, if you have to, if you say, well, I can spray if I stand 10 feet up wind and use the wind to help me. That's, <laughs> that's not a good approach. Not a good approach at all. Um, wait till a better time. Usually, usually either in the, if it's a, depending on what the product is, either at night at dusk, usually winds settle down and that's the time to apply. You don't, you try to get along with your neighbors. You don't want to make them mad at you. So, <laughs> so you do your best to do, to help them, to protect them. And again, everybody has their own thoughts and understanding about pesticides and use. And often when people see, you could be spraying water and, and some people will absolutely freak out. And, and that's, it, it's okay. You tell them what you're doing You say, no, no, I, I'm just, you know, I'm using a liquid fertilizer, which that's not a very good approach either because if you're using liquid fertilizer, Roots are in the ground. That's the absorbing mechanism. Leaves are not a good absorbing mechanism, but it's just what it is. And try and be try to be a good neighbor. And if nothing else, take them over some zucchini. You'll never have any shortage of, of zucchini. Make friends with zucchini. Um, oh my. Yeah. So the question came in: Is it advisable to use bug bags for Japanese beetles? My bags fill up, but I've heard the, the baits in the bags actually attract the pests. You are absolutely right. With Japanese beetles, do not use bag of bugs. Japanese beetles have two, have two, one of the, one of the pheromones they use is an aggregation pheromone, which says the party's here, come on. Usually the best way to control Japanese beetle is to get the first ones in your yard knock them into soapy water, <clears throat> drown them. That will slow down them, them finding you. But in that bag, that bag is um, an aggregation pheromone saying, hey, everybody come on, the party's here. This is where you come. Well, a beetle doesn't have a very large brain, maybe a tiny, tiny brain cell. And so it's flying along and it's just, all of a sudden it's antenna goes, Hey, I smell, oh, a party, party, party. It flies, it follows that molecule back. And if it happens to slam into that bag of bug top and fall in, you're happy. The problem is maybe only a third of them ever make it in the bag. The rest of them are ping, 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 bouncing around your yard. Yeah. So, Lorraine, your best bet is probably to put that bag of bug in your neighbor's yard. Exactly. <laughs> three or four houses down go ahead i got one for you <laughs> yeah. uh so <clears throat> lorraine she has a uh, question comment i have terrible problems with the japanese beetles on my green beans <clears throat> yeah and, and eric i'm glad you you used carborella or seven as an example for this because this is where i see a lot of gardeners overuse chemicals especially yeah. the dust if if you can't see the white powder if you can see it's any not. green after dusting seven, you have you've missed a spot. Yeah, you know you're right, Lee. The dust is a, is can be problematic. Um, for for that situation, I prefer the the EC. The problem with dust is that often if you get a heavy dew, you put the dust on, you get a heavy dew, it can actually wash it off. Or you get it to a point where it's so caked on, your plant is really struggling to survive. So in my, there's a better formulation for this. And that's what, that would be when the, ease, the multipliable concentrate 
the liquid form that you pour in the water mix, that would be the better formulation. With the dust, I don't think dust is that effective on Japanese beetles unless you've got it to the point where it's caked, caked on the leaves. So that would be my preference for, for a seven, the use of that dust. So Lorraine, I don't know if you have your pesticide license or not. Um, so the challenge with seven or carbaryl or pretty much any of the, the over-the-counter products you can buy at the store without a uh, restricted use pesticide, you're relying on contact mechanisms. So right. if you put um, seven on your green beans and hope that a Japanese beetle is going to come along and eat that a week later, it's not going to have any effect unless you're physically putting that seven or carbaryl spray, dust, whatever, directly on that, that beetle, you're not going to be killing it. So there is no systemic use of, or it's not taken up into the plant for long-term use. So you're right. That's, and, and you can't put that on because it says wait five days or so. You're yeah. actually off label if you're going back the next day because there was a rain, which often happens. Yeah. It, so I would say your better approach, as Lee indicated, would be to use that emulsifiable concentrate, which will hang around longer, more specifically. Don't have a license. What are my options? You should be able to get seven. Seven is still available yeah. as, a, seven, as a product. Seven works when it's used appropriately. So yes. outside of seven, I can't think of anything that is going to be labeled for green beans over the counter. Can you think of anything for insect control other than like diatomaceous earth and the standard, you know. Every food? once in a while, you can find some acephate, some orthene, but it's more often than not, it is literally it's it's literally seven is is in my opinion is the product of choice for Japanese beetles. Yeah. <clears throat> and Eric, speaking of label, and you you may have get this. Everybody loves preen in their flower beds. <laughs> preen is not labeled for use in gardens. So even though it is very effective in preventing weeds in your flower beds, it is not labeled for use in your. Um, garden so the question is why well there is a preen for garden for vegetable garden but it's corn gluten meal yeah it's yeah. <laughs> it's it's again it's that name so they use preen we talked about that with the labeling they use preen because everybody loves preen and everybody trusts preen they use it <laughs> they use preen but they change the ai the active ingredient we talked about that and what you're using is corn gluten meal, which is, it is not as effective, nowhere near as effective as trying to create this artificial barrier to inhibit weed seed germination. It yeah. just is not as effective. You'd have to put it down to where literally there, you've coated it. You've coated the earth. <laughs> and by then you'd be broke. It's easier just to buy, buy whatever you were growing. <laughs> yeah. And, um, if there are other questions, please use the chat box or unmute yourself. Um, don't don't be shy. And Eric, being a county educator, I'm sure you get requested a lot. So what's the good stuff, right? So what what's the good stuff? I, I hear that all the time. So the difference between restricted use pesticides and over the counter. Can you talk a little bit more about that and why? why you may right. not necessarily want the good, you know, air quote, good stuff? Well, because, um, yeah, the reason there's a good stuff and you have to have a license to get it is because inherently, remember I talked about the homeowners were probably the, the number one abuser of pesticides, in my opinion, and in my experience, it's been true. So, so most of the chemical companies if they put a product on the market, they, they actually have a 20 fold factor safety built in, assuming that, that homeowners are gonna mismeasure, make a mistake or something. So there's a 20 fold factor built in. When you have a license and you are a, 
you are you have the access to those products you are expected to use it as it says on the label and if there's any question of that you can expect a an app a ODA inspector Ohio Department of Agriculture inspector if there are complaints to come and inspect what you're doing so it kind of holds you to a higher standard of what you're doing when you get these restricted use pesticides they are much better um I have to say probably still some of the better are these pyrethroids are still some of the best products available to homeowners that are coming through, but everything's under rebuke now. Um, it, it is a problem because there is that built-in safety factor that no matter what, it's only going to be so-so. And that's for homeowner people's protections. I mean, I can tell you the stories about Malathion and everything else where a guy came in and he said, he said, what? He said, I have these crawling out. What is, what is it? I said, oh, those are carpenter ants. He said, I knew it. He said, so I poured that Malathion directly on the tree. And I was like, oh my gosh, why did you do that? He said, why? It, it killed him. I said, yeah, but every time it rains now, you are what's called non point pollution. Because you're diluting that product coming off the tree. And he was like, really? I think, yes. So some of that comes into play. But, you know, if, if you were really serious about wanting to sell product, you wanting to grow stuff, sell it, market, get your applicator's license. Get, your, your, get a private pesticide applicator's license. Because not only will you have better you'll have better products across the board that are more effective because you will be held to a higher standard. Does that make sense, Lee? Yep. And also with that, you're also going to have access to more modes of action to help yes. prevent resistance too. So uh, there was a question that came in. What's a good pesticide for use on apples and black raspberries? What are you trying to control? So, Caden, if you want to use the chat box or unmute yourself and give us a little bit more details, um, Eric can give you some answers on that. Um, yeah, I think Caden just took it off. What are you trying to control, Caden? Yep, because getting back to what Eric was talking about earlier, pesticide can be insecticide. Oh, there we go. Worms for the apples. More than log, that's coddling moth. Now, with coddling moth, depending on how many trees you have, there is a pretty good alternative for coddling moth. So you can use a, a pheromone bait. A, a pheromone, um, for coddling moth, that's the number one pest. That's typically the moth that lays an egg on the outside of the, of the apple. And that larvae burrows to the center, eats the seeds, and the apple falls. That's the coddling moth. There's three flights of cuddling moth a year. First one's about mid end of June, depending on where temperature is. Um, if I were to try and control that, there are what they have little twist ties that you can use these twist ties that are pheromone confusion that for that coddling moth. The coddling moth, there's the female releases this pheromone she doesn't fly very well she's a yoo-hoo and the male's like oh yeah well when you take two of those it's three you put three on the tree that pheromone is so fills the air that the that the male moth is like where oh she's here no she's over here no oh. so they really just never get together to lay eggs so that's one way if you're looking for a product probably Imidan is still probably one of the better products if you are I-M-I-D-A-N, D-A-N. Imidan is probably still one of the better products to use. I know that for homeowners, they want to push you to use a, a mix. An orchard mix is, awfully, is often what, they're, what they give you, which is a fungicide and insecticide. I don't like those very often mid-season it's okay 
But early on in the spring, right now, all we're trying to control mainly is, is the um, apple, apple scab. We're a little bit of maybe um, a little bit of the plum curculio. But most of it right now, you're using a fungicide to control that apple scab and not insecticide. So if you're applying an insecticide every time, you start to, I just don't like those combos early on or later in the season. Mid-season, that's okay. But early on, you're, you, you're putting on an insecticide, killing off your actual predators earlier on. I, I just don't like that combination early on. And Caden, I'm going to throw this out here. So this is a publication from Ohio State University. Oh, uh, yeah. Great one. Oh, you got your um, blur on. Yeah, let me stop that. Hold on. There we go. So this is a publication from Ohio State University Extension. This is a great publication to help you control uh, diseases and insects in not only apples, but there's also some information in here for strawberries, blueberries, brambles. Um, and uh, it may be one of those publications that we're able to send out at the end of the program. Um, I can talk with Cassandra about that um, at some point too. It's a great, it's, it's intended for backyard homeowner product. It's, it's not, it's not commercial guys. So it is a great, great product. It's a, it's a great read. Yeah. Um, it's one of those um, publications that is only 450 to download or um, five dollars to, to purchase and i i love to use this for um when people ask so what do i need to spray my apples i pull this out i'm like so what day are we talking because is, is yeah. it march is it april june july exactly so spraying uh, to control disease and pests exactly. and apples and fruits it, it's a weekly weekly occurrence not only is it that not only is it that what day what where are we where are we development developmentally in the plant or what are the conditions outside? Right. I've got a link that I'll, I'll send you, Rook. I've got a, 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 a um, backyard fruit growing from um, Purdue that is a pretty good resource, much like that one, that people kind of like to do it digitally. I'll send you that link, and you can send it out. Okay. Yeah. It's so free. That's a great thing. Awesome. So, uh, Caden, I'll put a link in the chat box where you can purchase these. Um, but if you want a hard copy, hard copy, uh, we have them in our office. They're, they're I think they're $5. So. Bulletin 780. And, and that's just one, one publication. We have several um, that, that we have that helps, but that's probably the easiest and most valuable one when it comes to to the tree fruits. And if you want to know more about tree fruits, Eric will be joining us um, later <laughs> during the series, and he's going to be talking about tree fruits and grapes. I don't have the date handy right off the top of my head, but I believe it's in about three weeks. He'll be back yeah. joining us to talk about tree fruits. And if you have never been up to one of Eric's pruning classes in Geauga County at Sage's Orchards, you're, you're really missing out. Uh, <laughs> when it comes to apples and pears and grapes, Eric knows his stuff. And Lee does the blueberries. It's a fun, it's just a great, it's just a great class because we, you can talk and look all you want, but all we have to do is take you out there. You bring your tools and you pay us for it. You bring your tools. We show you on one, we turn you loose and you do it. And, and it's so much easier to explain, to show, turn you loose. And it works. After that, people go home and say, ha, it was easy. Yeah, and it's a whole lot easier to practice and screw up on somebody else's trees. Exactly. And they clean up the clippings, too. Oh, yeah. That's great. Right. Are there any other questions for Eric before we leave for the evening? Eric? Right. Was I a firefighter or an EMS? No, I, I wasn't. Boy. All right. Uh, April 30th is when Eric will be back. Yep. All right. All right. With that, I will thank you, Eric, so much. This is very useful and informative. With that, I'll turn it back over to Cassandra. 
Thank you so much, everybody. Um, no additional things tonight. So we'll see you um, next Tuesday and I'll send out reminders to everybody and have a wonderful evening. Great. Thank Take you. Care. Have a great night. You too. Bye. So Cassandra, that publication, should we discuss that at some point about maybe including that? Yeah, you know, if we have like two or three different additional things that we feel like would be helpful, we can, if we send out a survey, ask people like, you're getting this, but out of these options, which one would you want? So if it's more of like a homestead, like, cause I was trying to find some other ones maybe as well, so. Or maybe it's a gift certificate for them to step, come out for you guys and purchase them or something. Um, sure. Yeah, I, I was know. also. It could be either or. Um, I'll I'll get some permissions, or maybe I'll I'll ask for forgiveness later. If we just download one copy and we provide the, the PDF copy in the the flash drive. I think we should do that definitely. If we can do that with anything, I would love to be able to have PDF copies. But letting people because we have a little bit of weight to play with for the packages to physically mail them. Okay. So. Okay, we can talk about it later. Yeah. All right, well, thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye-bye.